Okay, so welcome to the um, first session for the RStats Bootcamp here at Harper Adams University. We have a friendly uh, community, and I should say that a few people have questioned why I call this the RStats Bootcamp. And uh, I think the reason it has been questioned by just a few people in the past is that uh, there's this connotation of a boot camp as being something that's very testosterone laden, laden and uh, aggressive. But um, I consider this kind of boot camp, you may or may not be aware that the, the phrase boot camp has been co opted into technical fields uh, where the connotation when we're learning about coding and stats is that um, we, we learn something intensively in a short period of time to skill up. And um, so I like to explain that when I say boot camp, it's a friendly boot camp and it is created and shared in the spirit of uh, doing something good and doing it together. Okay, so I wanted to just explain that in the beginning. The way this will run for this first session is um, <clears throat> that um, I'm going to uh, each week go through one of the pages from the from the uh, website, which I'll share with you in a moment. And uh, this is the, um, the sort of flyer that I have, and I wanted to explain the symbology in the uh, flyer and the email. And you may see it uh, and wonder about it. And um, the rubber duck has a special meaning on the bomb. Okay, the rubber duck. Uh, have any of you in the chat um, heard of the term uh, rubber ducking? Have you heard of rubber ducking? Matt, have you heard of rubber ducking? Uh, I'm not sure about the contents. I'm thinking about bath time. No, it doesn't have anything to do with bath time, although it is a bath, a bathtub rubber duck. But the uh, term rubber ducking, uh, as some of you who've been around for a while know, I really like to use metaphors. It, it helps me translate the world sometimes, and I, I like to share them because it gives insight in the way I think about things. And I also like to have a little bit of fun with them. But the rubber duck and rubber ducking is a metaphor that I did not make up myself. Uh, well, I am riffing on um, Dr. Strangelove for this. I'm glad somebody noticed that. Uh, yeah, how I stopped worrying and learned to love the bomb. That is uh, from uh, Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove. Um, but in this case, how I stopped worrying and learned to love R. So that is part of the symbology in this. I'm glad someone picked up on that. But the rubber duck is not from Dr. Strangelove, as you know, if you um, are familiar with the film. And it has to do with the concept of rubber ducking as a, as a verb, uh, an action. And what it means is that um, sometimes when we're, when we're solving problems, when we're using code or we have a problem that involves data and we're using statistics uh, to do, we, we encounter challenges. We encounter things we don't know how to solve. And we need a system to systematically um, work through our our problem and um well there are various methods that people have come up with uh, some of the people who've come up with these are teachers uh some are professional statisticians some are programmers or or coders make a distinction programmers often might make a distinction between someone who builds applications they might refer to them using computer code they might refer to themselves as a programmer as opposed to um, what data scientists or statisticians do, we just do a little coding to um, impose some order on, on the world and make computers do what we want them to do. So when I encounter a challenge, uh, one of the methods that I use is I, and one of the methods that I'll talk about repeatedly in this boot camp is I try to um, break a, a big task down into smaller pieces. Um, smaller steps. And then the idea is that the smaller steps are simpler and we might know how to do some of the small steps. And then we only have to worry about figuring out how to do 
some of the steps we don't understand, and it might be simpler to do that. And the idea of rubber ducking is that uh, if you pretend when you come across one of these challenges, if you pretend that uh, you have a little friend with you, maybe you even do have a, a real little rubber duck sitting on your desk, and you explain the problem to the rubber duck, uh, with the idea that you need to explain it simply because rubber ducks probably aren't that clever, let's face it. So you break down the problem in a simple enough way to explain it to a rubber duck. And uh, in this way, you can, you can break your complex problem down into simpler steps and solve it easier. This is called rubber ducking or rubber duck debugging, okay? So that ex kind of explains the poster. And uh, with that, <clears throat> I have already showed you the um, website for the boot camp. Um, and today's page, the boot camp page one, is just to set up an intro. We're going to start very slowly today. And um, the spirit of these sessions, you can use them in any way you wish. Um, but the spirit of the each of these pages is for you actually to type in and participate in the code. I will pause now and again um, uh, during these sessions and say, right, now it's time for you guys to try what I just showed you. Right, so that's the uh, that's the way we'll work. Now today's will be a, a somewhat unique one because uh, we are starting with the assumption that some people may not even have installed the tools. So I'm going to explain the basic tools, show you the links uh, where you can uh, get the tools and install them on your own computer and talk briefly about an alternative if you can't or don't want to install anything on your own computer, uh, an alternative that you could use through a web browser to uh, to use all of the same tools with all of the same power and authority um, uh, that we would use them on our local computer. Um, so I've already dropped the link for the uh, boot camp into the into the chat, so I'm going to go on. And today's page is just set up an intro. But what is on the set up an intro page? Well, I'm going to just briefly outline um, uh, how the R Stats Bootcamp works. I've already said most of most of how it works, and it is quite simple. Um, that uh, it's a self-led resource that we're going to experience um, together to make it a little bit easier. I'm going to justify in a very brief fashion, why R? So you'll be able to uh, understand why why we why we choose this tool that you need to learn some coding skills to even use. I will talk through um, the installation of R and R Studio, how they're different, why they're different, why we need both of them, and uh, the alternative of um, R Studio Cloud. Um, I'm also going to. Um, give an overview of the uh, utility application that we use. I'll be using it a lot, and if you follow along, you will be using it a lot each week. It's called R Studio. <clears throat> this is just an interface to the uh, to the R toolbox. And then, um, as of today, uh, we always interact with R through scripts. And um, I'll explain what a script is. I'll explain how to set it up for best practice. Um, and, and why we do it that way. And then uh, at the end of every bootcamp page, including today, there is a series of practice exercises. And uh, for those of you who have come to these, these sessions before, you know that I like to, um, I, I really like these sessions. You know, it's, it's often the highlight of my week. It's something that I look forward to as opposed to something I have to do and stresses me. Um, and when I get to these practice exercises, um, uh, we'll go through as much of them as we can, but I like to I like to keep these sessions exactly an hour. And the, the reason is that we schedule it. And um, sometimes, even though I love to go into these sessions, we could go in for a really long time, but we have to put a pointer on it. So I will, I will end right on the hour. So we'll get through as much of the practice sessions uh, and practice exercises each week as we can. And uh, the idea is that if you, if you with me, 
during this um, one hour per week <clears throat> experience you're going to have with the boot camp. Uh, if you if you engage and type the code along with me, um, you'll probably be able to answer the practice exercises um, on your own, and you should to bolster what you get out of these sessions through the week. So uh, that is the philosophy of the um, the course. The whole boot camp together comprises um, comprises uh, a little bit of ed self led education material, which I will go through with you, and then there are these practice exercises. Now the practice exercises. Uh, with the exception of today's, because we we haven't even installed our, you know, as of today's uh, session. Um, for the practice exercises most weeks, I will demonstrate a problem and a solution, and the practice exercises are asking um, a very similar problem, just the details will differ. So if, if you go through the code, you will have already um, performed every solution at least once. And you're just adapting solutions um, uh, to, to novel in detail exercise questions. OK, so um, as I've mentioned, this is just a bit about how the um, RStats Bootcamp works. I may have already said most of this. It's, um, it's uh, all practical uh, and, it, and it's completely open. It, it is important to me and sometimes um, You'll observe that I, I might might criticize um, resources that you have to log in for and that might disappear and become unavailable because of administrative decisions beyond our control. It's a frustrating thing. Um, so I wanted this resource to be completely open, which is um, I wanted to say uh, is why I hosted outside of the university web pages. Um, so we could have a, a hub page or a Moodle page, but I think it's better not to have to uh, log in at all. And another thing, my own uh, personal philosophy, my own ethical philosophy for doing research is to do it as openly as I can. Of course, if you have intellectual property rights, we can't always do this if, if companies or some sensitive information is involved, but this is definitely not the case with this, so it's completely open. Also want to give an overview of performing basic statistics, traditional statistics. I, I shouldn't say simple statistics. These are um, tools in the coming weeks like uh, linear regression, analysis of variance, um, correlation, how to visualize all of those tests, uh, how to test the assumptions of all of those tests, and if your data don't meet the assumptions, alternatives to those tests. Um, we're just going to do all of those. I shouldn't call them simple because they're not always simple, but I should call them traditional statistics. And it's a it's a foundation that's required to go on and do um, modern statistics. All right. Another thing that we'll do by the end of the um, boot camp uh, sessions is we'll explicitly have a few sessions on reproducible research and collaboration tools. One of the ones that I already mentioned is GitHub. Another one that I um, did not mention yet is called Markdown. It's a way to prepare um, slides and reports that you can write for other people in an automated way that is documented and reproducible. And, and as a matter of fact, the slides that you're looking at were made with computer code in R, and they're completely reproducible. Um, the philosophy, uh, as I've mentioned several times, is that it's self-guided learning and self-assessment. Those those exercises are designed so that you could go ahead if you wish, and you could um, use them as formative assessment. But most people find it easier and more effective to go through as a group. Uh, and another thing is participating in the boot camp opens up our community. We have a lot of regular attendees to this. Um, many of you are uh, PDRAs. Uh, there are some PhD students in here, and there are members of staff in here, and uh, we're all very friendly, and um, we all communicate with each other. And we all love to solve problems like this. Okay, so uh, just participating makes you part of the community. Now, this there's a lot of words on this slide, and I'm just going to use my cursor to keep my place over here. But uh, I want to say a little bit. I'm not going to. I could give a whole talk on why we pick R. Why R? 
sometimes people have asked me, um, I've got this other piece of software that I use and it does all the statistics I need. Why should I learn R? And my answer to that kind of question is uh, if if you don't need R, you don't need to learn R. Um, those kinds of people tend to be people that are um, past the stage of students. They've already got a job. They tend to be people that um, that um, have a have a tool set and they've exercised it a lot. And um, and maybe they're the kind of person that doesn't doesn't plan to learn anything else in in their life unless they absolutely have to. So uh, for everybody else, if you're younger in your career, if you like to learn things, and if you are interested in incorporating new tools as they're developed, well, then this slide is for you. So uh, one of the things that I could say, this is speaking both as an applied scientist, but also as a statistician, is that um, objectively, there are some reasons why R is the best statistical software that's available. It, the important part there is the statistical part. A reason for this is that R is very popular amongst statisticians and applied statisticians, especially in universities and in companies. And it has been for many years. Um, I started using R over 20 years ago. It was not as popular back then. It was new and the, the um, user base was much smaller than it is now. Um, what makes it the best though, is the fact that because it is popular and has been popular amongst um, creators of statistical tools for a very long time, is that it's the most up-to-date software um, to perform statistics. All of the, the modern techniques that you read about in papers in many times have been done in R and the tools were invented in R and they don't exist in other software or they're not very easy to get at. Another thing is that Right from the beginning, R was designed for people that, that don't do scripting or programming with a computer programming language. So it's a R is a piece of software, but it is also a programming language. And um, the people who developed it were statisticians and, and programmers. And they, they thought, listen, we want to share this set of tools we made with the scientific community. We want to do something good with it. And um, how can we do that? Well, they designed the names of functions and the names of the tools in the toolbox to be um, logical. Now, some people, you will encounter things in R that aren't logical, <laughs> but yet um, many of the attributes of the language, the nuts and bolts of it uh, are uh, designed with, with new users in mind. Uh, you gain an advantage from using R. Uh, many of you will be aware just because you're here that it's desirable to know R. It's in wide use. A lot of people use it. Um, job advertisements for academic positions might mention it and often do. Um, I just hired for a, I just interviewed for a postdoc position um, here at Harper. And, uh, uh, you know, R was one of the minimum requirements for it. But now um, it's mainstream for many companies to uh, to want R skills if if they have data handling that involves statistics. Uh, and in, in regulatory industries, in the human medical industry and the knock-on effects that that large um, sector has on, on other um, private sectors, um, in in Regulation, R is an accepted um, reproducible standard for data analysis. And so uh, it increases your employability to learn these tools. I've already mentioned another advantage, the very large community of users. Now we have a pretty good community here at Harper, but by beginning to use these tools, you become part of a much larger community. One way to measure this, I don't think I'll touch on this, um, in the rest of the boot camp, but when I began using R, there were about um, and, and back in the <laughs> that was long enough ago. This was uh, in um, it was around the mid 90s to the late 90s that I first started using it. There were about 200 
packages, which are sets of tools, sets of stats tools to uh, to use in R. And we'll begin using packages later. Don't worry about it if, if you don't know what those are yet. But they're 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 basically bundles of tools to do particular things. There were about 200 of them back then, which was huge. You, you know, how can you possibly learn all 200 of these things? I started to think. And uh, now there are over 20,000 packages of tools. Uh, and they've been contributed by the large community and the much, much larger group of users who haven't created the tools themselves often share and are open and very friendly. It's It's really a welcoming, scientific community. A big advantage is that it's free and open source. I started thinking about this a long time ago um, when I was, uh, as a PhD student in statistics, I was doing consultation with all sorts of people, research projects, uh, some international. And one of the commonest questions I would get with um, people I was working with was, uh, this was even Right when I first started using R, but maybe I was using different software to uh, to consult and collaborate with. So say say SPSS, um, I would be working with someone. I, I remember some people I worked with for several years in Belize, uh, and they would say, "We cannot afford SPSS. Can you please please send us a key? Because we can't even do anything. We can't even do simple things." I'm sorry, I can't send you a key. Uh, it's been like that for every piece of software that I used that wasn't free and open source. And it's one of the, the biggest changes in my career for the better is that we have this the best piece of software, which is also free. And by the way, open source, I won't mention it very much in here, but um, what it means is that um, not only can you, you can you download and use this software for free, but you can, if you have the skill and the inclination, the desire, you can look at the actual computing instructions underlying R, and you can you can alter them. You can make them better. You can contribute new packages yourself by virtue of it being open source. So it's uh, it's free. We like to say, in the sense that it doesn't cost any money, and it is also free in the sense that you have liberty to do with it as you please. Okay, free as in free beer and free as in liberty. Um, it is another big advantage that R is very lightweight as a program, even though it does um, very sophisticated analysis and can be used on what we call, uh, you know, big data, but it works well on, on all sorts of computers even very old ones or ones with low memory or modest performance. And it also works well on um, the major operating systems, the major OSs. Uh, so Windows, many of you will be using Windows. Um, are there any Mac users? If there's anybody who uses the Mac, just would you put a Mac in the chat to represent yourself? But R works fine on Macs uh, and it also works on Linux. Uh, I don't know if anybody does use Linux. Um, Matt, I know, dabbles in Linux. Uh, I see a few Mac users. Okay. Um, now, this last one is, uh, oh, interesting. A, a Linux user, that's interesting. Um, this last one is one that um, people are often surprised when I say that uh, R is actually easy to learn. And um, it, it has a steep learning curve. But once you get past the very beginning, uh, it, it, it is easy to learn relative to other computing languages. And, and I think this is one of the easiest ways to really improve your employability as, as a, as a um, researcher that is beginning your career. One of the best ways to improve your employability and easiest ways. Now, <clears throat> I want to say a, a few things. Now, um, you basically need to install R and R Studio. I, I want to explain um, the difference between R and R Studio a little bit to you. Uh, if I just change to a um, a pin, oh, it won't let me change to the pin. That's okay. I'll uh, I'll stick with it. Then I'll persevere without a pin. Um, 
R is, we can think of this as the software that performs calculations that we want it to do. It will we'll do all the work we want to do with data. It will read in the data. It will allow us to make graphs and it will allow us to perform statistics in the simplest sense. But uh, R Studio, if you haven't um, encountered uh, coding tools before, is what we call an uh, interactive development environment, an IDE. And it, it's just a piece of software that has some utility tools that allow us to use R efficiently. It's not the only one you can use, but it's the best one by a mile. Uh, I, if you've done some coding before, you might be thinking, can I, can I use R with other computing um, IDEs? And the answer is totally yes. <laughs> you can use Notepad++, you can use uh, um, VS Code, you can use um, you know, Sublime, you can use any of those um, IDEs that you like to set it up if you have the inclination to do so. But R Studio is different. It is actually made just for R. It, it has these days utility to work with other computing languages as well. And it just has some things to make your life easy. And so almost everybody, especially when you're beginning, you'll want to use R Studio. One of the things that I'll show you in a moment that it does, we won't do it much today, but we'll look at it in the future, is that it, <clears throat> when you're looking at the text that comprises um, computing code, oftentimes when you're when you're just starting out, it just looks like a bunch of gibberish. And uh, one of the things that our studio and the other IDEs um, do for us is they provide what we call syntax highlighting. It just makes it easier to read and identify problems. Now these links, uh, if you download the talk and just hit them, they they are just uh, searches on Google to install for Windows. But I'm just going to bring in um, a web page. Uh, and I've just typed install our windows and uh, we can just go to uh, the CRAN stands for the comprehensive R archive network. And the latest version is uh, 4.3.2. Okay, it was the first, the first hit on my search. In fact, the first couple of hits are all um, are all appropriate for this. So uh, you don't need the newest version, but uh, you probably want 4.3 and above. And if you already have 4.3 and above, that's fine. And uh, the other thing that you can search for is uh, RStudio. Now, until very recently, RStudio was made by a company called uh, RStudio. But somewhat confusingly, our studio have been going through some um, some growing pains, and maybe I would refer to them as growing pains. They would probably say they've gone through a little evolution, and they've changed their name to Posit. It's kind of a nice name, but uh, the IDE our studio is formerly known by them as our uh, studio desktop. I'm just going to put this link in the chat, and uh, they have this nice little page that comes up. It's it's the one that I have linked on the slides as well. And um, they have a link to the official R installation. And they have a link to their official R Studio installation. Now R Studio desktop is uh, free to install for non-commercial use. You can install it and uh, use it forever for free, but it's not open source. Uh, and if you are using it for commercial purposes, it does cost money. So it's just something to be aware of that doesn't um, affect us for any of this. And it, it may or may not affect you in the future. Can I just take a survey in the chat? Um, is there anyone who um, has not already installed R in R Studio? Can you just say no or yes if you have? have or have not installed R in R Studio yet. Can I get some no's and yeses? Okay. Some no's. 
Yes, it's an irritating thing about the um, IT um, folks. <clears throat> my my advice on this, if you have a university laptop, you will require the IT folks for help, and uh, you'll need to ask them to install the latest version of R and the latest version of R Studio for you. Um, so uh, if, if any of you are in that boat, where you need to do that after this session, what I'd recommend is um, is to just go ahead and and try to do that. Just send send them an email, or just phone the IT help desk and put in an, um, a ticket, and they will come and install, or they'll ask you to bring your computer to the desk, and they'll install R and R Studio. It should not take very long, and they they should be able to do that at the desk. You could even cold call them. They don't like that, but you can tell them I sent you if you wish. Um, but they will do it just at the desk. And if any of you have trouble installing it after tonight and you, you want some help uh, or you feel you need some help you can't solve, just, just let me know. I'll be happy to help. Uh, either help with um, IT or to help on the installation itself. No problem. Just let me know. <clears throat> yes. Um, that's a good point. Now, uh, some of the, if you're using the computer lab computers where they do regular updates, um, you will, yeah, a good couple of good points. Let me address these points. So one of them is that Tim said that our studio may be available on the software center. And that is true. Uh, if you go down to one of the network computers where they, they do updates and you're on the regular image, um, not everybody has a laptop that's on that that image that's updated regularly, but if you are, it may be on there. A slight issue with that, and this is a bit of an annoying one, a slight issue with that is that it, it may not be and probably isn't the most um, recent uh, uh, version, either of R or R Studio. And uh, you can just check that out by by looking at the, as a general rule of thumb, you want a recent version of of um, R Studio. So th this most recent version was released uh, just just a few days ago. Um, you don't need the most recent one, but if you're more than six months out, you probably do want it because it's constantly developed and they're fixing bugs. And but the most important reason that you want it uh, a recent version is that um, our packages, I mentioned packages, uh, so this is sort of setting the seed for our future sessions. Um, you need a, a recent version of R to, uh, to be able to install the most recent version of R packages. And if your R version gets too old, you will not be able to install the latest versions uh, with all the default settings. You'll have to do extra work, and that's very frustrating when you're beginning to use R. And George makes a point about um, about uh, giving ad admin rights. They may well be discussing giving people admin rights. Um, it doesn't take the IT people very long to get sick of me calling them. So uh, you can get admin rights if you're very annoying to them and you know what you're talking about. <laughs> but they may not give it to everybody. So. Uh, may, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the the system now, as far as I know it, if you have a laptop and you want the newest version of R and R Studio, is you can just call them up or take your laptop in there, and they'll they'll come do it, and they're pretty good about doing it. Okay, I see a few people have not um, have have not done it, so um, so that'll be some homework for this week that people will need to do. Now you do have some other options. For uh, for using R, uh, where you don't have to install a local version, and one of the options is remember I said the company formerly known as R Studio, now known as Posit, is um, <clears throat> has got a cloud version. Now, if anybody is interested, is there anyone in the chat who has used Posit Cloud or R Studio Cloud? Uh, just a why in the chat if there is anybody who has used it. it. It's free. I say it's a limited free account. You can go on this. This is a, um, I'll just open up the, um, 
the um, POSIT cloud page. You can sign up for a free account um, to just sign up for it. I would, I, I would take, you could use any email you want. Um, it's limited because um, when you sign up, you, um, you uh, sign up for a free account and they give you a limited amount of hours per week that you, um, that you can use this. And this works just like any other cloud service. Nice thing about it, I haven't even shown you what our studio looks like, and I see that our time has uh, gone very fast today. So I've been having fun talking about things. Um, is that uh, you start projects, so called projects, that are some of a snapshot of things that you upload, like um, data sets and scripts that you create. But the, a nice thing about it is that um, once it opens, we'll be able to see that it looks very similar to the way that uh, the local installation of our studio looks. So uh, keep this window in mind. Up here is a script. Down here is your console. If I, um, if I uh, submit what version we're in, I can see we're actually on a slightly older version of R on our studio cloud, but it's above version four. And I probably could update this if I started a new. This is a project I might have started a year ago and it's saved all my settings. And I see that it forced and want to update on me, but but maybe not subsequent ones. So it saves all of this stuff. The limitation is that unless I pay a little bit of money, I can't use this for more than 25 hours a month and I need to remember when I'm finished using the session to close it down. And okay, we may, if anybody's interested in that, I'd be happy to talk more about our studio because it's uh, the deposit cloud that is, because it's an interesting alternative. Another alternative is Google Colab or Google Collaboratory. Uh, mostly people think of it as a online place where you can use for Python. But what people may not know is you can use it for R, and um, you can use R in it just just as easily as you can um, in Posit Cloud, but it doesn't look the same. It doesn't look like our studio, <laughs> Google Colab. So if people are interested in that, I'd also be happy to give a little uh, demonstration of that. So you have some options, even if you can't install it, to follow along with us. And maybe the easiest option, if you can't follow along in the short term, is Posit Cloud. Now, this is a, an image of um, our studio desktop. Now, the colors used in this are a little bit different than the one we looked at online. I find it easier on my eyes to have a dark background and bright text. And so I just tend to go for that. Um, let me know if it's hard for you to see if I'm coding in that, the color that I like to set, and I'll show you how to set this yourself when I bring up um, our studio in just a moment. The color, the theme that I like is called cobalt. And it's got a sort of blue background with bright, very bright, high contrast text. And that's the easiest on my eyes. You notice I wear glasses, one of my whole life. And uh, as I've, as I've, aged I say it like that i find that uh, i rely on the high contrast more than i did when i was younger so if i just bring up our studio real quick I'm just going to um, close this project open a new instance this is the version that's just installed on my local computer, um, <clears throat> you can see that I've got these windows. And uh, the only difference between my real desktop in this picture is that um, I have, uh, there is actually a, uh, several scripts open. You can see different tabs with different scripts. So I often may use more than one script, but we'll start off just using one script at a time. 
down here is the output. We'll practice using that as or as soon in just a few minutes from now in our last few minutes together today. Something called the global environment over here and some other tabs called history and connections and tutorial. The environment tab uh, is a place that visualizes where data objects are stored. So you get a little visual information about your data when you read it in. And then down here is another area. Um, and there are a few tabs, files and plots and packages. Uh, we use it a lot for the plots window and I call it the plots window. This is where we um, you know, get a visual of the plots that we make of our data. Okay, so these are the major components. Um, once you set it up, you'll just be spending some quality time in here. If any of you are interested in it, I will indulge um, just a minute to show you um, how to, how to, um, sorry, that keeps going away. I'm trying to get the, ch the chat up so that I can um, see the chat in case anybody says anything in the chat. <clears throat> just yell in, in case somebody sees, uh, says something in the chat, if somebody notices it. Um, that uh, if you go up to the tools and global options, so it's the tools drop down menu. Down at the bottom is global options. And that comes up all sorts of options. And you can play with them. Most of them, it's safe to leave them all at the defaults. In fact, if you don't, if you like the the um the um the color scheme with a white background, you can just leave that at, at default too, but you have the option here of uh, changing your editor theme. Like I said, I like Cobalt, but uh, you can change it to others and we can see some of them over here. So Chrome is a bright white background, but I'm gonna go back to Cobalt. So you can play with that yourself if you want to do that. Okay, so we will interface with that in just a second. And I'm just gonna introduce in this first session um, how to interact with um, are with some commands and we're going to start very simply and we'll start doing um, some some work as soon as next week but the the basic way to interact with um, with R is through what we call a script and a script is nothing more than a plain text file on your computer and it, it's just like a word document I don't know the level of computing that everybody in the chat has but we'll all be coming in at different levels but uh, it's a little bit like a word document except that word documents have all sorts of formatting embedded into the files around that text to make it look a particular way. And a plain text file doesn't have any of that formatting. And that's all that an R script is, just a plain text file. The thing is, <clears throat> it's recognized as an R script instead of a text file, because we end the file name with .r. Um, if you're into computers and computing, this is the file extension uh, that the operating system uses to recognize that particular file and associate it with RStudio. Um, now we think of the script as the interface between what you want the computer to do and uh, what the computer does through the R software. So uh, another function of the, the script is that it documents your analysis. I'll say more about that in just a moment. And um, it's the, um, you know, you can think of it as the, the, oh, I've got it twice, the uh, interface between your commands and our software is so important of a concept, I said it twice. Um, an important thing, the, the real important thing here though, is that your script should be organized and logical. And it, it can be thought of as um, having importance to uh, other people. That's a way to, um, to think of, of, uh, of that. <clears throat> so, um, the way that I think of it is, uh, I hope some of you who've been in sessions before may remember this um, distinguished gentleman. This is R.A. Fisher, the father of statistics. And uh, what I imagine with the R script is that it should be good enough to show a friend, okay? The friend could be like your supervisor or a collaborator, or um, often um, I find this with myself, um, that uh, if I write a script in a week or two weeks or even much longer period of time passes, my future self is an important person <laughs> to, to write my script for. 
um, you want to write it for someone you respect. You know, write it and uh, comment it in a logical, structured way so that it makes sense to that friend that you respect. So I imagine that I'm writing scripts for R.A. Fisher. Now, uh, these are some best practice things that I very strongly encourage you to uh, begin on your first day using R. If you don't do this formally with scripts that you write, I invite you to start. This is best practice, and it's it's really for that future respected self. Is a, a typical script will always have a header. I go ahead and even label it explicitly. I know it's funny. People have commented that they think my scripts are funny because I have literally labeled the header as such. But I have done it for years, and it's always worked really well for me. Uh, in the header, I put who wrote the script, what the purpose of the script is, and when it was edited. And I always put the date in ISO 8601 format. If you've never heard of that before, you can Google it and read about it after. This is important because this is the format of dates you should habitually use because it's the format of dates the computers also use. And anyone can understand this format of date, whereas the inverse month and day slash year is ambiguous internationally. And computers don't sort them correctly without help. A second section is a content section. I label it explicitly contents and I label the different sections of my scripts. Now you can design these organically. We'll start using these as soon as next week. And uh, then the rest of your script has code chunks. And uh, you know this, this could be like the first line of a code chunk that starts with a, a, a hash sign and it ends with four hash signs that demarcates it as a code chunk. Um, the title of your code chunk should be descriptive of what's in that. So you might say, read in um, the data and environment setup. That will probably be the first, something similar to that will be the first code chunk in every script if you're doing data analysis. Um, you can number your titles, that's optional, but maybe it, it adds a, um, a little bit of detail. And these code chunks uh, with this syntax exactly, provides a visual cue to the structure of your script, but also a navigation function, which I'll, I'll show in a second. Um, and then there are just some, um, some comments that you put in. Th th these are examples of little bits of code. We'll run this in just a second. But the hash at the beginning of a line is used as a comment to explain what the following code does. So in this case, the comment says it's a vector of numbers. And I even tell you, this is a comment. And uh, OK, a vector of numbers. So uh, in this case, this name, my underscore variable, uses an assignment operator and assigns a values for a vector of integers. You don't have to worry about this stuff yet. We'll get to that in the next um, session. But um, it's just to, to talk about what comments are and how they work. And what if you wanted to calculate the mean? In this case, we're using a function. We know this is a function because there's an open bracket and a closed bracket. And uh, we're, the name of the function usually connotes what the function does. In this case, it calculates the mean. What does it calculate the mean of? It's calculating the mean of the vector of integers contained in my variable, which we just made. Um, and through these comments, vector of numbers and calculate the mean, even if you don't know about R, you can have some understanding about what's taking place here. And that's the point of this slide, comments. Figuring out about how the functions work, we'll do in the future. Now, um, before I go over and do a little bit of code, we have to talk about how to actually run code. And it's the last little bit that we're going to do today. And uh, there, there are several different ways, and I'm going to demonstrate all of the ways. Um, if you like to use hotkeys, these are combinations of keys that automatically run. You can run a whole line of code wherever your cur cursor is. So you can click on a line of code, and you can use the hotkey control plus enter on Windows or command plus return on Macs. And that will run that line of code. Alternatively, 
Maybe you have selected some code. You've highlighted it with your cursor. Uh, and it's maybe it's less than a line or maybe it's several lines. And then you hit control enter to submit it on Windows or command return in Max to submit it. And there's also a run menu, which I'll show you. Which is a button above the script window. And there's also a drop down menu called code. And we'll use code, choose the run section, and those both also work where your cursor is either um, on the line that your cursor sits or the selected code. So if I go quickly over to the uh, bootcamp page and I scroll down to where we just were, <clears throat> we have uh, some practice exercises and there's a practice exercise that says to download this script. So uh, you can just click it, it will download. And if you've installed R in R Studio, you can just open it and it will open in R like this. Because we're running short on time, we're at the end of the time, but I'm gonna go for five more minutes, and just finish this. I'm gonna go quickly, but I encourage you tomorrow or even this afternoon, run through this a little bit uh, and try it yourself. And if you have any problems, let us know uh, and we'll help you. I'll help you. Here, we notice that our script, I'm going to just make the script a little bit bigger so that you can see it better. <clears throat> notice that it, there's a header. It's the RStats bootcamp. What is it? It's the number one bootcamp setup. Last edited, when was it last edited? October 2022. I haven't, I haven't edited this file since then. It's got a uh, table of contents. And it, the first code chunk is going to be looking at the iris data, a famous data set that's built into R. And the second one is going to be uh, to make a simple graph. So the second one, even though it's um, labeled one because I've started the numbering at zero, um, it's kind of a programmatic way of doing it. So we're going to look at the iris data. And the only thing that I want you to do, you don't have to understand this code, is I just want you to submit it. Here's the run button I mentioned. When I run this, um, it's going to just load the R um, iris data set, and I think it will pop up up in the environment. Let's just try to do that. Three, two, one. So two things happen there. One is the iris data set popped up up here. If I pull this out a little bit, it's 150 observations of five variables. Notice when I ran that, I selected this. And if you're using Windows, you can just hit Control Enter and it will run it. I'm just going to run it again. Three, two, one. Pleasure, George. See you later if you have to go. Anybody who has to go, I'm just going to keep recording until I just finish this example. But I know if you have to go, it's fun. Um, another thing that happens is it echoed my command down here in the console, which is kind of nice because um, it lets us know that things worked. So the comment here is that we're telling R we want to use a data set and it reads it into active memory. The other thing that I'm going to do is uh, use this head function to just print the first six lines of the uh, of the data. So I'm just going to select that and click run up here. I would usually use control enter all the time because it's just fast. You get in the habit of it. But you know, if you prefer, you can click this run button. Or I mentioned this other way, you can go up to the code section. And we can go down to run selected lines. It's about two thirds of the way down. I'm, I'm mousing over it. The text is quite small. Notice that it gives you the hint of the of the hotkey control plus enter, but I'm just gonna click that and it'll it'll echo. The command down there, but it will also print the first six lines of the data set. Here I go, three, two, one. Because I have the magnification quite high, it wrapped it around, but it, it has a variable called sepal length, and these are the first six values of sepal length. So the iris data set is measurements of um, parts of flowers for three different species of iris, of uh, plants, flowers, and plants in the genus iris. So irises, 
Uh, there's a sepal dot width, the width of the sepal. These are in millimeters. Petal length. Um, these might be in centimeters, actually. Petal dot width. So irises have petals that are um, long and thin. And then there's a character of the species. There are three different species, so there are 150 observations. I just know the data set very well. Um, <clears throat> we can also um, utilize this window down here. This code demonstrates that. Now I've got my cursor. No problem. See you, Isabel. Got my cursor on line 21. I'm going to hit Control Enter, and what's going to happen is the help menu for a little help page for the iris data set to explain it will pop up and we'll we'll explain all of these functions um, in the coming sessions but i'm going to just go ahead and run this with control enter three two one so we can read about anderson's iris data it's sometimes referred to fisher's iris data because ra fisher used it uh, to demonstrate principal component analysis about 100 years ago almost to the to the year uh, and then finally, we're going to make a simple graph. We're going to make a box plot that measures. It's going to make a graph of sepal length as a function of species. And we're using the box plot function to do that. So I'm going to make the plot window a little bit bigger in anticipation of that. Maybe I don't want to go through in detail what this, what all these parts mean, because I'll explain that in the future. The idea of this is just to interface with R. So down here, the graph will show up. When I run this, I'm going to hit Control Enter in three, two, one. And the default graph is not bad. Um, and R is really powerful at making beautiful, um, detailed graphs, especially scientific graphs. What we have here is a sepal length on the y axis. We have the categorical variable species on the x axis. And we have box plots. Uh, I love to talk about the history of statistics and um, the box plot. You might think that it's called um, a box plot because there is a box, but it's not. It was invented by George Box, famous statistician. He humbly named this graph after himself. This is the interquartile range of your data, and the whiskers define the range. So the graphic is designed to have statistical meaning for this. Now, I can't believe that our time ran so quickly today. Let's just go back and um, make sure that we uh, look at our last slide, which shows a little bit of rubber ducking and invites us to do the practice exercises, which we already did. I'm just going to end the slideshow because we're op over um, time here. But I do want to ask if um, anybody has any comments or questions. Has anybody encountered any difficulty that they need help with right away because I'm willing to stay and uh, help anybody who needs it. I'm just going to stop the um, recording.